This is your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 207. Welcome to your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Welcome back, everybody. This is a really exciting podcast today. We have back on the show the amazing Kristen Neff. Now, as you all know, we're doing a 30-day self-compassion challenge, and it is the perfect time to bring on Kristen Neff, who has written a new book called Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. Now, while the book is directed towards women, it actually is for everybody. So we're speaking today in this interview about fierce self-compassion, and it's for everybody, and it's particularly valid to those of us who are struggling with anxiety and have to really work hard at facing fears every day. I am so grateful we got to have Kristen on. She had so many beautiful things to say. So if you like the episode, please go over and purchase her book. She too has a book out. And again, it's called Fear Self-Compassion. Um, and it might help you really deep dive into this practice of fierce self-compassion. Before we get over to the show, and let's talk about the I Did A Hard Thing segment. This one we have is from Eric, and he has said, I've been working on my anxiety about the heat by spending every day I can in the sauna of my gym. I work up a good full body sweat and it feels so uncomfortable, but I stick with it knowing it will pay off. So Eric, this is so amazing. What an amazing way for you to stare your fear in the face, practice being uncomfortable. I love it. Um, and in addition to that, let's move right over to the review of the week. And this one is from Emily. Emily says, Kimberly consistently shares a genuine compassion across all of her podcast episodes. She's been a source of encouragement on my journey with OCD, anxiety, and depression because her message remains one of the consistent self-compassion while sharing a realistic perspective and the reality of mental health struggles. Thank you so much. So you're so welcome, Emily. I am just so honored to be on this amazing path with you all doing such amazing hard things and you know, really doing the hard work. It's it's really an honor to, to, to hear these stories and hear the hard things you guys are doing. Okay, that being said, let's move over to the show again. Thank you so much, Kristen Neff, for coming on. I just found this episode to be so deeply helpful um, with some profound concepts, and I can't wait to share them with you. Well, welcome. This is a honor to have with us again the amazing Kristen Neff welcome thank you for having me happy to be here with you again yeah so you have a new book out which is by far my favorite I am so in love with this book fierce compassion yes I actually have mine on my kindle so I was like holding it up going look it's right here um so thank you. I loved this book. Thank you for writing it. This is so important for our community because you're talking about how to use compassion in, I think, ways that we haven't talked about before um, yes. and is so important for those of those people who are suffering with anxiety or just any kind of severe mental illness or struggle. Can you tell me exactly what fierce compassion or fierce self-compassion is? Yeah. So, uh, well, self-compassion in general is just concerned. Well, compassion in general is concerned with the alleviation of suffering. It's a desire to help, right? The, the desire for well-being of others. And then self-compassion is of yourself. 
And there are really two main faces that has, or two main ways it can express itself. There's tender self-compassion, which is really important, um, which is about self-acceptance. It's about being gentle, more nurturing, warm with yourself, uh, soothing yourself when you're upset, you know, really offering support, uh, being with yourself and all your pain and all your imperfection in a really accepting, kind way. <clears throat> and this is a huge, hugely important aspect of self-compassion because most of us don't do this, right? Most of us are, think we aren't good enough or we, you know, we, we criticize ourselves, we're really harsh with ourselves. So this is huge, um, but it's actually not the only aspect of self-compassion. So sometimes compassion is more of a gentle, nurturing energy, almost like you might say a mother, mm -hmm. right? Metaphorically a mother or a father, but a parent. Fierce self-compassion is more like mama bear, like mm -hmm. fierce mama bear. In other words, sometimes in order to alleviate our suffering, we need to take action. Acceptance isn't always the right response right. when we're suffering. Like, for instance, if if you're in a situation that's harmful, maybe someone's crossing your boundaries or someone's harming you in some way or threatening you in some way, whether it's society, maybe you know it's racism, sexism, or some sort of injustice, um, or whether it's yourself, mm -hmm. maybe you're harming yourself in some way, right? Although we want to accept ourselves as worthy people, we don't necessarily want to accept our behavior. Right? And so sometimes we need to take action to alleviate suffering. Mm. So that could either be protection against harm. Um, sometimes it's providing for ourselves. In other words, and this is especially for women. Women are told they should always self-sacrifice. They should always meet others' needs. Actually, sometimes for self-compassion, we have to say, no, I'd really love to help you, but I've got something I need to tend to for myself. Mm -hmm. So taking action to meet your own needs. Uh, and then also motivating change, right? It's not self-compassionate to let behaviors or situations slide that are not to your, not healthy. And so really taking the action needed to motivate healthy change. Is, but it comes from encouragement, not because, you know, I'm unacceptable unless I change. Right. So the, the tender and the fierce self-compassion, they go hand in hand. And it's I like to say it's like yin and yang. Yep. We need both and we need them to be in balance. Right. And if they aren't in balance, it's a problem. Right. Now, this is so good because my first question was how to get it into balance, right? I love in your book, you have yeah. a little questionnaire on, is, you know, you, you fill it out is, you know, is there balance in, and is it lopsided at all? But can you share right. how yeah. people may get some balance if they're finding they're doing one of the other? Yeah. So, um, and, and it's a tricky question, right? Because sometimes we don't know, but we need to ask. So really the quintessential self-compassion question is what do I need right now to be healthy, to be well? Uh, and just pausing to ask that question is huge. Usually we're just like doing our daily routine or we're striving to reach these goals that people tell us we need to reach. We don't even stop to say, actually, what do I really need to be healthy and well? You know, so asking that question is huge. And then, you know, you may not, you may not get it right at first. You may think, oh, actually, I thought I needed that and I don't. So really self-compassion is a process. But it helps to know the different types of self-compassion, right? You might say, do I need a little tenderness right now? Do I need some acceptance? Do I need some softness and gentleness? Do I need a kick in the butt? <laughs> do I need to get going? Do I need to stand up? Do I need to speak up? Right? Do I need to say no to people? Maybe I'm giving too much of myself to you know to find balance. So you really just have to ask yourself the questions, um, and it's really the process of being committed to yourself that you're going to do the work necessary to be healthy and well. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've outlined yeah. so many pieces of this puzzle, right? Particularly, yeah. and this is why I I was just. Oh, I, I think I reached out to you months before your book came out because I just wanted to hear your opinion on this is for people who are struggling with the inner bully, whether that be the disorder yes. they have or they're just very self-critical, it yes. can be really hard to stand up to that. Um, yeah. Almost feeling like it's just impossible. I've heard people saying like, this is just who I am, right? I'm just going to have this right. voice. So I'm yeah. wondering what you might sort of maybe share, like, where would somebody start with this practice? Yeah. And, um, and then we also need to get in the different parts of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Because the inner bully, right? That's a part. We also have a part that's compassionate. We also have a part that feels bullied, 
by the inner critic, mm -hmm. right? So we, we've got we've got the you know the person who's pointing their finger. We have the person that feels the shame. You know, we've got all these different parts of ourselves, and really all of them need to be uh, treated with compassion. But how that compassion manifests is going to be different. So, for instance, I have a compassionate motivation exercise in there where, um, you know, sometimes what we need with the inner critic is we need to thank it. Mm. Thank you for trying to help me. Like the inner critic, may, this may be the only language it has to try to help us. And it needs to feel listened to and heard. Mm. So thank you so much for trying to help me. It's actually not been that helpful, but I appreciate your efforts. That's almost using more more the tender self-compassion for the inner critic. But sometimes it need needs the um, standing up. It's like the mama bear, like, I'm sorry, you're not gonna I'm not gonna listen to that anymore. You you can't say that. It's not okay. Right. I'm drawing a line in the sand. Right. 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 So that's part of it. But then also we don't want to forget having compassion for the part of ourselves that feels criticized. So people who say the inner critic, that's just who I am. Well, actually who they are is there's a part of them that hurts from the inner criticism. Mm. There's a part of them that feels compassion for the pain of that. There's a part of them that's trying to help keep themselves safe through criticism. Inner critics don't operate really to try to harm. They operate to try to help to keep us safe. Like they think, so I, I've talked about a lot in my book, my son has um, very harsh self-criticism. And I can see he really believes, um, by the way, I'm just going to turn this off. Sorry. <laughs> it's going to be clicking at me the whole time. No there, we, there you go. Um, so, so my son really believes that if he's hard with himself, that somehow it's going to allow him to get it right and not make mistakes. And so usually our inner critic, some part of it believes that if we're harsh enough with ourselves, we'll get it right and not make mistakes. Yep. And that's the safety behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to have compassion for that safety behavior at the same time that we don't want to um, be railroaded by it. Yeah, so, yeah. It is complex. The human psyche is is complex. Pretty much the answer is always compassion. Right. Uh, but what form that compassion takes just depends on what the situation is. There's no there's no one size fits all. Yeah, and and I think that it's so important that you're addressing both the yin and the yang side, right? Because yeah. there are times when, let's say. Um, somebody's struggling with incredibly painful, intrusive thoughts with related to their, their OCD or their disorder right. where they mm -hmm. need to really just go, wow, this is so hard for you. I'm so, so sorry you're going through this. But there exactly. is other times where you have to be like, nope, we're not doing this today. We're not going to go yeah. down that road today. So I think it's beautiful yeah. that you're bringing that together. And it's funny, I have to use both sides with my son, right? If he, if he goes and cause he, has, he has both autism and OCD, as I was, I was telling you, um, and anxiety, just to make things fun. But, you know, sometimes what he needs is he needs my warmth and compassion, just that, that caring, that tenderness. And he, always, he knows always the bottom line is unconditional acceptance. But sometimes I need to draw boundaries. And I, like if he's he's learning to drive, for instance, and he started having an episode while he was driving. And I'm like, no, right. you you know, you cannot do this while you're driving. It's not safe. Right. And, you know, and, and he and I can see that part of him has hmm, part of him doesn't have the ability to stop of it. Stop it. But part of him does. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's complex. Yeah. And so sometimes I need to appeal to that part of him who, that ha does have the ability, at least temporarily, to say, I'm not going to go there right. and say, you need to choose. Right. You know, you, you need to stop. And sometimes I say it almost really firmly and it kind of shocks him and it actually helps him to stop. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 complicated. It really, really <laughs> is. And now it's interesting because you're um, you and I were talking before and I, I want to touch in because the first part of the book now, the, the book is directed specifically to women, but it also is addressed to anybody, I think. Yeah. I right? mean, all people need both yin and yang. Yeah. The reason I do it for women is because women are so socialized not to be fierce. Yeah. And that's partly why we've been, that's partly patriarchy. Right. You know, women have been kept in their place by not getting angry or not speaking up. Yeah. 
So that's why it's written for a woman. But a lot of my male friends have read it and they say they get a lot out of it because, first of all, all the practices mm -hmm. are human They're for, for all people, mm -hmm. not just women. Right. So, but, yeah. but the reason I loved it is you did speak directly to getting angry, right? Yes. Like there's a lot in the front about getting angry. Is it helpful? Is it not? Do you want to share? I mean, I think a lot of people who are anxious are, are afraid of their anger or afraid of yeah. that. So do you want to share a little bit about how people can use these these practices for anger? Yeah, well, because a part of part of the whole messaging of the book is um, anger can be an expression of compassion. I mean, think, again, think of fierce mama bear, that ferocity, you know, and, and think if someone were to try to harm someone you loved, you there would probably be this arising of anger that comes up to protect. So anger is one of the, is a protective emotion. Right now, again, anger has can be problematic for sure. So it's it's very easy. What's what's the difference between helpful and unfelt helpful anger? It's dead simple. <laughs> helpful anger alleviates suffering. Unhelpful anger causes suffering. Mm. Right, and we know it can do both. Mm. But anger should not be um, undervalued as an important source of protection and compassion. It energizes us. It focus at, focuses us, it gives us energy, it suppresses the fear response. Mm. So especially with people with anxiety, right? So it's funny, my, my son is afraid of dogs. <laughs> it's one of his anxious things. And I taught him very early on that when a dog is um, threatening him, to rise up and like yell at the dog and flap his arms <laughs> and ah, scare the dog. And he does that, and it's funny, it also gives him it kind of helps suppress his fear response for the dog when he does that. Because he's basically getting angry and yelling at the dog to back off. Right. Now, I have to say, sometimes he overuses it. Like he's done that with like poodles at the park. Like, <laughs> poodle is not a threat. But, you know, <laughs> poodle will survive. In his mind, the poodle is a threat, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so being able to call on that fierce energy, it one, one of the things it does is it does suppress the fear response. Right. 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 And so if you never allow yourself to be angry, it's harder to, to you know, it kind of um, it feeds into that fear response. Right. That, that anger can actually be opposite to the fear response. Right. So this is so. where this is so beautiful, because I actually a lot of the work I do with my patients is instead of being angry at the dog or, or expressing anger is to talk yes. to fear and set the limit yes. with fear, right? Yes. Um, you were talking in the book about like the inner critic and the inner voice, so it could be the inner fear. And, and so I yeah. often will have patients is to say, no, fear, like, you can come with me to the dog park or you could come with me to yeah. this, but you are not winning. Like, and to really get, like you're exactly. showing, getting yeah. really strong with and angry back at the fear, which I that, think is another that, approach. Yes, that's right. Which is that fierce. And again, you can say, thank you for trying to help me. So in my son's script, you know, thank you for trying to keep me safe, but you aren't helping. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of the both. Yeah. It's, it's the appreciation because we don't want to feel that any parts of ourselves are unacceptable. Mm. So if we make our inner critic or if we make our anxiety or OCD or any of those parts of ourselves feel unacceptable, then we're harming ourselves. That's so we can the key accept point. It with love, with the tenderness, just, I mean, just because my OCD is not helping me doesn't mean it's not acceptable. And act as a way in which it's, it's a beautiful part of me trying to keep myself safe. So it's, it's differentiating between us as people and a particular behavior. Because behaviors can be helpful or harmful, but we're all okay exactly as we are. Right. And that's the, that's the point. Like you just dropped the mic on that one, right? That's so yeah. important is, yeah. is as we're navigating, and, and this is actually a question more than a statement, is as we're navigating standing up to fear yes. or depression is that yeah. we're not – disregarding it or criticizing the fear that's inside us either. Yeah, because it serves a purpose. All of these emotions serve a, a, and usually it comes down to safety mm. or the sense of belonging or some sort of deep survival mechanism because these are all evolutionarily, you know, they came from our brains and our brains designed to, were designed to survive. So they have a negativity bias. They, you know, they tend to get really anxious. They tend to use the fight, flight, or freeze response. Mm. 
fight is the self-criticism. Flight is kind of the, the, the fear response or the shame response. Freeze is when you get absolutely stuck, you right. know, over and over again, like rumination. Interesting, which may be related more to OCD. I've never thought about that, but it might be that that loopy might mm. be the freeze response where you're right. just like stuck. Right. All right. of these evolved as safety mechanisms right. as a way to avoid like the lion chasing you. And they still remain um, in our brains, even though right now, you know, nowadays we don't really, most of us, at least in the first world, don't have those types of threats to our physical being as often. Right, right. Um, so. Oh, I love it. Okay, so you already touched on this slightly, and I just want to go over it quickly, is how might people use fierce compassion as a motivator and as an, something that encourages them? Because I think yeah. that... I think the way I conceptualize it is you kind of conceptualize the the basketball coach who's like get up in there and just go harder and and it's yeah, it's yeah. motivating but it's almost also very critical. So can you share a little on right. that? Right. Yeah. So so critic self criticism or harshness it does kind of work as a motivator. So there are coaches like that who do get some results out of their their players. Um, but there's a lot of unintended uh, consequences. Anxiety, actually, believe it or not, is one of the the um, bad by poor byproducts of criticism, mm. because fear of failure, mm. fear of not performing up to your ability, you know, fear of making mistakes, that actually gets generated when you know that you're going to beat yourself up if you don't meet your goals, right? Then that actually adds to your anxiety, and that makes it harder to reach your goals, right? right. Fear of failure, procrastination is a classic example, self-handicapping. Some people do that because they don't want to risk failure because they're too afraid of failing because they know they're going to be so harsh on themselves that they do fail. Mm. And so, um, but some people make the mistake of thinking that self-compassion is just about acceptance. Like, well, it's okay if you don't succeed, you know, well, every, you know, everyone's imperfect. And although it's true, it is okay if you don't succeed. And it is true that everyone's imperfect. That doesn't mean that you don't want to succeed. Mm. But the reason you want to succeed is very different. So, so some people want to succeed because if they don't succeed, they're a failure. They're going to hate themselves. They're going to shame themselves. Other people want to succeed because, hey, they want to be happy. They care about themselves. They don't want to suffer. Right. And that is it's a much healthier form of motivation. It comes from the desire for care and well-being as opposed to fear of failure or inadequacy. Right. And then because of that, when the bottom line is, hey, I'm going to try my best. I'm going to do everything I can to succeed. But if I fail, that's okay, too. What that means is the anxiety levels go down. There's less fear of failure. There's less procrastination. There's less performance anxiety. And this is the key. When you do fail, you're able to learn from it. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a true truism that failure is our best teacher. And if we shame ourselves when we fail, when we're full of shame, we can't actually learn. We're just we're just hanging our heads. We can't really see clearly. We can't process. But when it's like, okay, wow, that hurt. Mm, ouch. Well, everyone fails. What can I learn from this? It doesn't mean that I'm a failure just because I failed. Right. And that ability to learn actually helps your motivation and helps sustain your motivation. Right. Just It's just much more effective. And we know this w with our kids. And a lot of coaches know it. <laughs> Not all coaches know it, but a lot of coaches know it with their players. They may be tough, like mama bear tough. But the thing about mama bear is you always know mama bear loves you. She's mm -hmm. doing it because she cares, right? When it's just like snarling at you, you don't get that sense of being cared for. You get that sense of being inadequate. Right. And we know the difference, yeah. including with our own internal dialogues. We know the difference. Does this come from a place of care or a place of shame? Right. Right. You know, you know, it's interesting and you probably know this, so probably experienced this. But as I was um, writing my book, um, I was saying nice things, but I caught myself saying them in a tone that wasn't nice. So I, yes. I was, I was going, no, I haven't said anything. I was saying like, you could do it and keep going. But the tone was so mean, like, keep, keep going. going. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, well, tone's so huge. Um, actually, they're, they're, um, one of the main ways that the, idea, that the feeling of compassion is communicated, especially the infants before they get language, is through touch and through tone of voice. Mm. Right? So universally, we know the certain types of touch that feel caring and supportive and others that feel either indifferent 
or I'm threatening in some way. Uh, and also tone. There's a certain quality mm. to the voice when it's caring versus when it's harsh. Right. And most of that's communicated to infants before they know how to speak. So it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Mm. And it's also how you hold your body. Right. So there's physical touch, but even just like, you know, is your body slumped or is it like upright? You know, physical signals of care are, are really important. Hmm. So How, we, we teach both. Right. Yeah. How might, and I'm asking this actually for myself because it didn't occur to me to, right now, is how might I be fierce with the tone? How does the fierce tone sound? Yeah, so it's, it's firm, mm -hmm. but it's not harsh, mm. right? So it's like, no, that's not, that's not okay. So it's like, no, that's not okay. Or, right. you know, it's not like vicious. Like you, it's not, it's not like, no, that's not okay. You stupid idiot. Yeah. 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 It's like, no, that's not okay. Yeah. That's, that's the nuance stuff. that I, I think uh, I have to work on. No, it's, not, it's not really okay. Is it, is it, it's okay? No. Uh, you know, it's like right. waffling and wishwashy. And by the way, I'm saying this is so it's not easy to get it right. And I get it wrong all the time. But so fierceness and tenderness have to be balanced. And my problem is I even though I was raised as a woman and for most women, they aren't allowed to be fierce. I'm actually probably more young than yin just by nature, just by, by my genes. So my problem is I'm too fierce without being tender enough. So I'm always apologizing and saying, I'm so sorry, you know, um, you know, please forgive me because I, I get out of balance the other way. Sometimes yeah. I just say it so bluntly and I forget to cushion it with some sort of niceness or reminder that I care. Right. And that's not healthy either. Right. Um, so it's a process, right? It's not like a destination. You get there and you're done. It's like, okay, I got it wrong this way. I got it wrong that way. So you always have to be trying to recorrect. Right. But as long as you allow yourself not, not to have to be perfect, then you can keep going, you keep trying, and it is a process. It's a process of compassion. Right. Um, and it's actually not so bad as long as, you know, the goal isn't to get it right, it's just to open your heart. Yeah. And so as long as we do all of this with an open heart, with out of goodwill, the desire to help ourselves and others, then it's okay. Right. Um, but but it is tricky, and I would be lying if I said that it that it wasn't. It is. Yeah. Here I am thinking that I'm really good at this stuff. And, and, and I was hearing my tone and going, wow, that's, that's not cool. Like you're saying yeah. kind things, but it's not with a great tone. Um, yeah. I have two more questions or things I want to touch on really quickly. Will you talk about these two topics of fulfillment and equanimity? I know you touched on them in the book, but I want to, I loved what you had yes. to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, so fulfillment is um, also an aspect of self-compassion, right? So if we want to help ourselves and be well, we really need to value what's important to us. You know, first of all, we need to know our values. You know, is it just what society says? You have to earn a certain amount of money. You've got to look a certain way. You've know, got to be popular or what's really important to us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's personal, like music or art or nature. Um, sometimes it's honesty or sometimes it's helping others right so but we know our inner values and part of compassion is asking ourselves what's really important to us and valuing ourselves enough to actually fulfill our own needs um, and again there's a there's a gender difference men have raised feeling entitled to get their needs needs met it's not really the question of course i'm going to get my needs met doesn't everyone well actually not necessarily um, and class and a lot of things go into this, but gender certainly does. Women are valued for being self-sacrificing. Mm. Women are valued for, um, especially toward their kids, for denying their own needs and helping others. That's how people like us. That's how we get our sense of worth. And so that sets, up in a situ sets us up in a situation that in order to feel worthy, we have to give up what's important to us, which actually undermines our own sense of self. Um, so... The sentence the term we use is how to you know give to others without losing yourself. Yep. And part of that is knowing what you need to be happy and fulfilled and giving yourself permission to take the time, energy, effort to meet those needs. Yep. It's not instead of other people. It's in addition to. It's like in, including yourself in the equation. So my research shows that self-compassionate people, they don't subordinate their needs, 
but it's not like my way or the highway. Right. They actually are more likely to compromise and say, well, how can we come to a solution that meets everyone's needs? Right. And that's really what we need to do to be balanced. Yeah. I loved that. I really did. Oh my goodness. This is so good. So um, before we finish up, would you tell us where people can hear about you and your book or your books? Tell us where we can get to you. Yeah. So probably the easiest place to start is just my website, which is selfcompassion.org. If you Google it, you'll find me. I got in early. So all the algorithms come to my website, just type (laughs) self-compassion, you'll find me. Um, and so on that site, I've got, for instance, if you want to test your own self-compassion level, you can take the scale that I created to measure self-compassion. Um, I have guided meditations. I have practices. I have exercises. Um, I have a new page on fierce self-compassion that especially has fierce self-compassion exercises. Um, I have research. If you're a research nerd, there's like hundreds and hundreds of um, PDFs of research articles on there. Uh, and there's also a link to the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion, which is really um, the nonprofit I started that does self with Chris Germer, um, that does self-compassion training. Right. So that's also a really good place. You could take courses online. You can get training really easily now. Yeah. Okay, so. And I've taken the training three times and in three different <laughs> ways. So one was a weekend, one was the uh-huh. eight week course, one was a two day. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I think that it can meet everybody's online. I did one of them that finished online because of COVID. Um, right, yeah, right. Really, really right. great. Really, really yeah. great. So thank you. Is there anything you feel like we've missed that you want to make sure I, I we cover before we finish up? Maybe just to... Uh, I just I just like to encourage people just to try it out. I mean, the research is overwhelming in terms of the well-being and strength and resilient self-compassion can give you. And life's tough and it's getting tougher every day with this pandemic and global warming. I mean, everything's really, really tough. And so we have this resource available, this resource of, of friendliness, of kindness, of support that's available at any moment. Mm. You don't have to sit down and meditate. You don't have to go, even go to a class. You just have to think, what do I need to care for myself in this moment? Yep. And you can actually do it. So it's like a superpower mm. that you, people don't even know they have. And it, it's just like to tell people, hey, you've got this ability. It's right there in your back pocket. You just need to remember to take it out. Mm, I love so, that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so grateful. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.